we are going to talk about memory. But first, class, do you know why humans can't hear a dog whistle? I see a couple of answers. It's because dogs can't whistle. <laughs> <laughs> we can't hear the dogs whistle because they they can't whistle. <laughs> but but speaking of memory, one of my earliest memories was is uh, my family taking me to get glasses as a kid. Everything before that was a blur. <laughs> oh, um, yes. Well, right. It's class time. Yes, indeed, it is Friday, February 2nd, 2024 class, and we are going to talk about memory tips and tricks today. We have had our welcome and our chat, talked a little bit, and now it is time to get to our learning check. From our previous lessons, have you been applying any of the skills from lessons we've talked about in your life? Recently, we've talked about budget-friendly nutrition and we did a mindful eating exercise. We've talked about things like sleep health and so on. Did you apply any of these in the last week? Is there any you'd like to have some clarification about or have any questions about before we continue? I don't see any other questions. We will go into how we always start our lesson with our breathing exercise. As you know, before we start our lesson, we like to get ourselves into the right headspace, to like to get ourselves nice and calm and focused. With this breathing exercise we learned, you've done it before, you know how it goes. Yes, yes, for those who are new to our breathing exercise, like I said, sit up nice and straight, but comfortable, feet on the floor, shoulders back. You're going to put one hand or paw or claw or talon or whatever it is that you have on your abdomen and one on your chest about where your breastbone is because we want to feel our diaphragm rising. We want to feel our abdomen extending, not so much our chest. We breathe far too shallow and far too quickly. So you want your hands to feel the air being pulled deep down into the lungs where we have more surface area and the oxygen has more time to absorb. And during these breathing exercises, We'll only breathe three times, three breaths in through the nose. We'll hold it gently for a, for a period, and then we'll breathe out through our mouth. In through the nose, hold, and out through the mouth. We'll do this for a count of four seconds on the inhale, holding gently for seven seconds, and then letting it out for eight seconds, making sure to pull it down deep. I'll have a graphic up here in a moment that will show you where, and I will count it out as well. Prefer to listen. We're looking, there it is on the screen. I'll give you a moment to get ready, let you know when we're going to start. But as we've talked about, our rapid, shallow breathing these days leaves us more susceptible to stress and anxiety can hinder our immune system. But we want to take some time to consciously breathe slower. These three breaths will take about one minute. We typically breathe three to five times faster than that. So you can imagine how much that adds up over a day. So, you ready? Next time you see this pink ball come around to the dark green, we'll start breathing in. Give you a count. Ready? Three, two, inhale. And hold it. Breathe out. All out, let your lungs empty completely. Come back around and breathe in. And hold. And exhale. And 
One more time around, breathe in. And hold. And exhale. All the way out the full eight seconds and there you go. Three breaths. All it takes is three breaths to fill one minute. Breathing nice and deep and slow. You can do that anytime. That's a great breathing exercise. First thing in the morning to get yourself centered. Great breathing exercise right before bed. It's also good anytime you're feeling anxious or stressed. We had a great piece of music in the background there. Today we are going to be talking about memory. Seems like a pretty simple concept. What do you think about memory? What do you think your memory level is at? In what ways do you think memory is a little bit like some of the things you see on the screen here? These hard drives and flash drives, SSDs, the save icon. What ways do you think it's different? Like I said, we're just going to talk about the very basics to start with. And don't be afraid of this diagram. We're not going to talk much about the brain. I just wanted you to see it. You do have one inside of you. Unfortunately, it is not color-coded like the one you see here. There are three main brain areas just to touch on briefly when it comes to memory. And the first is that, that part in the front, the part right behind your eyes, the part in your big old forehead. That's the prefrontal cortex. That's the thinking part. You put your hand to your head like you're trying to think really hard, that's where that's where the thinking happens. The, the hippocampus, the little brown shaded area you might see there, it's named after the seahorse. Apparently that's what hippocampus means because someone somewhere thought it looked like a seahorse. I don't see the resemblance, but um, the hippocampus is where the large mammals go to learn eggs. That's a good joke. That's a good one. The hippocampus. The hippocampus is where most memory is processed and stored. So that's where your trivia is. The amygdala, which is the little red spot you may see there connected, is the emotional center of the brain. So when I asked people on Twitter and in the discords and places what their earliest memories were, most of them had early memories that were emotionally charged, things that had a lot of emotional weight. A first Christmas or the first birthday they remember. So it's not surprising that the emotion center being connected right next to the memory center would mean that memories that have emotional significance are so much stronger. But yes, these areas, the hippocampus consolidates these memories. Now that's the basics about the brain and memory. We don't need to remember all of that so much. Remember, this is a skills-based classroom. I don't need you to remember which parts of the brain do what. We're here to learn some useful skills. But we are going to mention these stages of memory because this is going to be important. The first thing we do is to encode a memory. When we see something, it's in a visual form or we hear something and it's in audio or we touch something and it's in a sensation of feeling. The brain needs to encode it in a format that it can actually be used and stored. Like the film in a camera being digitized into a an mp4. So if you meet someone new at a party and you learn their name, Mr. Aegis, your brain codes that auditory information into a code. Then the next step is consolidation. This is where it's stabilized and organized for long-term storage. So after that party where you meet me, you meet Mr. Aegis, the neural connections to that part of the brain where it's stored are strengthened. And it's connected to areas that are associated with it, like 
my appearance, or the context in which we met at a party. And then it's stored. Retaining that data is encoded, consolidated over time. So the memory of you meeting me is stored in the neocortex. All the details about our meeting, my name, what the party was like, how you felt meeting me, those are then stored for future retrieval. And in retrieval is where you are actually accessing it later, purposefully. You remember that you met me and you're trying to remember my name and whether or not it's successful. It occurs and you remember the person's name. So if you learn more about me later, you learn about my interests, my, my occupation, these will strengthen that because you'll have more context. It'll be a, a more full story, a full picture of me. Lastly is amplification. This is when we're consciously remembering things and repeating information to enhance its retention. So if after meeting me, you try to remember it by repeating the name over to yourself. Okay, what was his name again? Oh, it was Aegis. Aegis, Aegis, Aegis. That can help to strengthen that memory. Yes, yes. That's just a little bit about the stages, a little quick bit on the stages. And we get into the other two stages that are not about remembering, but are about forgetting. Of course, we don't really need to define forgetting. We know that it's not being able to retrieve the information that we've stored. But if you don't actively recall or reinforce the memory of meeting that person, there is the risk that you might forget the details might forget specific face details, might forget what we talked about. Interference can also happen when you get new information or competing information that disrupts the retrieval of those memories. So if you meet a lot of people at that party, that's going to make it more challenging to recall any specific person. Unless, of course, you stand out. If you make yourself really stand out at the party, people are going to remember There's a couple of little pages about the basics of how memory works, stages it goes through. Like I said, that's not something you need to remember. I'm not going to quiz you on that. You can always go back and rewatch it later with our memory tips in mind so that you can remember. What I want to ask though, what are your thoughts on the usual methods? After hearing a little bit about the brain parts involved in memory and the stages we go through in memory retention, what do you think about the ways in which we normally try to learn things? What are the usual methods that you see people normally using when they're trying to study something or remember something, learn something? Here are some of the, the common conceptions, the things that people usually do. This is the sort of, you know, common knowledge of how people learn. The usual MO in schools. The first one you probably can see right off the bat is passive rereading, where we simply read something and read it over again and hope that it stays in our brain. But it doesn't really work that well. Passive rereading without active engagement, usually not very effective for long-term retention. And then as you mentioned there, Bit Shepherd highlighting, highlighting everything, mm, excessive highlighting when you're not really thoughtfully selecting it probably just going to lead to information overload. Multitasking. We've talked about this one extensively in our lessons on overstimulation. Trying to do more than one task at a time, trying to study while engaging in things like texting and social media can lead to reduced concentration, and so you're not going to have as good of memory consolidation. And lastly, cramming. Last-minute intense study sessions it might work in the short term, but it's not really going to work for long-term recall, is it? Nope. And we'll talk about why in just a little bit. There are three others that people do a lot that don't really work that well. And that's passive listening. Where you're simply 
listening to someone speak, listening to a lecture on a, a recorded video or a podcast or audible version. Typically, it's really easy to space out and do other things while you're doing that. So the memories really don't get encoded. And then, of course, there it is, rote memorization, just starting to, just trying to remember facts and figures as much as possible. Remembering data, remembering dates, remembering numbers without context for them. And last is tech reliance. Trying to rely on apps or learning games, not learning games, uh, learning apps that uh, give you hints or reminders and stuff. Probably not going to do as well either. So let's talk about the alternatives. What should we do instead of passive rereading? The alternative to passive rereading is active engagement. Instead of just reading through a section, you want to summarize smaller sections. Instead of reading a chapter, read a paragraph and summarize that paragraph. Ask questions about what it said as if you were explaining it to someone else. Teaching, as someone said earlier, I, I believe Shiko. Read that one paragraph and then to yourself or to another person if you have someone available, explain to them what it meant. Not, not what it says, but what it means. That is one of my favorite techniques after I, I read a paper if I'm just taking a walk or I'm exercising or something, I'll have a little conversation in my head with a hypothetical person. I'm, I'm normal. I'm normal. Not an actual person in my head. It's just me talking to myself. But I'll have a little conversation and act like I'm teaching that person what I, what I just read about. That's a lot of strong, active reinforcement of what you've just read. Instead of highlighting a lot, the next technique can, you can use as an alternative is to highlight only very few critical things and write notes next to it, filling in the gaps. The next one, instead of multitasking, we've talked about single tasking before, but I'll mention it again. The other thing you can do though is create a learning zone. When we did talk about sleep, we talked about keeping a sleep area that's just for sleep, right? So that your brain is primed to think this is the time to sleep. Well, you can't always just modify your desk space or wherever it is that you do your studying and learning. But you can sort of create a virtual environment for yourself. Create a, a dedicated study environment on your laptop or computer. Change your desk arrangement, change your wallpaper something that is just for when you sleep or just for when you study just for when you're learning get yourself in a headspace that this is a time for studying and learning it shepherd suggests using your public library fantastic advice no better place to feel like you are in a learning environment uh yes instead of cramming you want to do active engagement you want to save yourself a lot of moments by pre-planning your learning segments this one's really important because I want you to connect this with our lesson on sleep. Remember what happened in stage two of sleep. Does anyone who took our sleep lesson remember what stage two did? What happened to our brain in stage two? What did it do? In one of the stages of sleep, your brain goes through consolidation. There are little spikes in your brain waves during stage two little period of quiet in the brain and then a spike of brain activity where your brain is consolidating and collating and collecting all those memories and organizing them, which is why sleep is such a huge factor in consolidating information. You literally do think better when you sleep on it. You want to be able to give your brain time to actually put that memory into long-term storage. If you only think about something once, not going to be there very strongly. Yes, yes. 
So some of these are very study heavy. They're about learning through study, but they can also be applied in the working world. Let's say you get a job managing expenses in an office. Your coworker shows you how to submit the checks in the company system. Uh, yeah, well, you'll want to sleep on it and then ask them to show you it again and reinforce it. Of course, passive listening, where you're just listening to a lecture, doesn't work all that great. So make it active by asking questions. Always be asking questions whenever you can, even if you're somewhat sure. Having them reiterate it, and usually they'll reiterate it in different words, is just going to make your learning all that faster. Asking questions for clarification makes it more concrete in your mind. So again, if you were to say, get a new job and someone is training you, what do we usually say? We, when they ask if we, if we got something or if, you know, if they need to explain it again, oh yeah, we got it. I got it. And then two days later, you're not sure how to do your time clock. Ask the first time, get clarification, reinforce it the next time. And of course, we don't want to do rote memorization, just facts and figures. We want to find relationships. We want to find the connections between things. We want to understand the concepts. And this is where acronyms and mnemonics can be very helpful. Let's use a work reference again and say, you get a job in an office. One of your duties is sending your department's expenses to the accounts payable department. And you're thinking, oh, there's a lot of steps here. Hmm. I got to enter the amount Then I got to enter the vendor, uh, then the address, attach the receipt. I need to say what it's for. I need to send it to the right department. Uh, how am I going to get this all, all right and remember it all? Let's see. I make a little anagram for it. Make a little acronym see here. Enter the amount first, then the vendor, then the address. Then the receipt or sales receipt. And then the date. I tell myself time. I note the purpose. I send it to the right department. I note who it's for. Oh, I made myself an acronym. A vast PDF. A B A S T P D F. Acronyms are exceptionally powerful things where for remembering steps and in processes. Can anyone tell me a famous example of a, an acronym and trying to remember things in a school context, say math, for example? Can anyone tell me a famous, say math acronym? I've got two great ones right here already. Bit Shepherd and, and Pocket. We have Pedmas or Pemdas, depending on where you live, and Sokotoa. So in math, when you're doing a multiple, when you're doing a, a function, an equation, do the parentheses first, and then the exponents, and then division or multiplication, and then multiplication or division, and then addition and subtraction. That is the order in which you do an equation. That helpful acronym helps acronym, acronym helps you remember that. Acronyms, thank you, Evie. Acronyms can be very helpful in, in helping you remember things long-term. I wanna get into a few other augmentations, other things that you can do. Those are better ways to study generally, but here are some more specific practices. One of which is visualization. Bit Shepherd, your sister taught you the quadratic equation as sung to the U of M fight song. I will forgive you for using the U of M, but that's a great technique. In visualization, you use mental images to represent the things you want to remember. And the more vivid, the better. 
So if you're trying to remember what we talked about in our budget food video, picture yourself actually using it. Picture yourself going through the grocery store and actually putting it into practice. Association is obviously something that can be helpful too. Associate something you're learning now with something you already know. Like a recipe you're trying to, to put to memory. Associate it with another recipe that you do know how to do. Chunking you've probably heard of. Probably heard of this technique before where you break down large amounts of information into smaller, more manageable little bits. The simplest way to put this might be you're trying to learn a new piece on the piano. But instead of learning the whole piece at once, you just learn one line at a time. Three others that we'll talk about are Method of Loci, or Mind Palace, which you've probably heard of in TV shows. That's, this is a little bit abstract. It's associating pieces of information with specific locations. A, a familiar place that you know well, and you mentally walk through that space to recall the information. One particularly strong way I hear this is used is to take the statements or ideas that you're trying to remember, walk through somewhere you're familiar with in your mind, mentally walk through that area, and put those things down in a place there. Like you take the first part of this discussion we're having, and you mentally put it down on the bed. And then you walk to your desk, and you put the next part of the discussion or the next fact you want to remember Put that down on your desk. You walk to the living room and you put one down on the couch. Put one down on the kitchen table. And then you go back and you pick them all up in the order that you put them down. That's the mind palace method. Next one we'll talk about is rhyming and chance. I love rhyming and chance. Rhythmic patterns make things very much more memorable. Jingles fall into this category too, which is why you'll have things like, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there, in your head forever, because it's a memorable jingle. It doesn't have to rhyme even, but if it does, all the better. I won't ask if anyone remembers one because I have one I don't want to talk about right away. You may remember this rhyme. <clears throat> 30 days hath September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31, but February 28, with leap year coming once in four, February then has one day more. I don't think I would be able to just remember offhand which days of the, or months of the year have 30 and 31 days if I didn't have that little rhyme in my head. If you can create a little rhyme that helps you remember a piece of information, it'll stick with you very well. Last for the memory techniques are keywords and cues. Ah, uh, yes, yes, bitch ever. We do not need to see the JG Wentworth video again, but it is in our hearts and in our minds. We recall it now. Keywords and cues can be really helpfully used to trigger a memory. This is really good for presentations. It's really hard to remember an entire presentation that you're trying to deliver. Trying to remember everything word for word. But if you can use keywords from each segment, section, sec, section that you want to remember, it makes it a lot more manageable. So if you want to give a presentation to your coworkers on unionizing, you'll remember, say, just the key points you want to hit. You want to start in the introduction. Uh, you want to talk about hours. Talk about the difference in hours under the unionized deal. Just remember, hours, start, finish. Okay, that reminds me, I want to talk about changing the policy of requiring us to arrive early without clocking in and clocking out, but having to stay in clean. You don't have to remember that whole thing, because just having that keyword in your head, okay, hours means this. But you want to hit that next point about how checks aren't paid till Monday, and you don't have that money for the weekend, but you just remember the keyword, checks. 
associating things with keywords can make things a lot easier than memorizing an entire section. Yes. There are some physical things we can do, though, to also help us with memory. And those are some things that we've talked about in the past. We've talked about sleep, talked about getting physical activity, talked about good nutrition. We've talked about socialization, but in specific, isolation from others when you're learning can be more difficult. That group work, those group study sessions are more valuable than people realize. Limiting yourself to just your perspective on something when you're learning it hinders your learning process. Hearing other people, even if they're struggling with the material, reinforces your learning. Reinforces the concepts you're talking about through discussion. But just to hit these four lightly, when you don't get enough sleep, you don't have enough time to consolidate. Like we talked about in that sleep lesson and a little bit earlier. Physical activity, of course. Regular physical activity imp increases your cognitive function. And lastly, did say nutrition. We'll talk about just briefly some of the nutritional parts that can help with memory. <laughs> Noma, Noma says better than remembering, just remembered where to look it at. Well, you still have to remember something then. Bit Shepherd talks about rubber duck debug, where you go line by line and explain what the code does to a rubber duck. Sounds like some of the things we're talking about. Yes, yes, the there are some nutritional things you can do to help with your brain function and memory. When it comes to vitamins, C and E are antioxidants and it can help protect the brain from stress. The B complex vitamins, especially 6, 9, and 12, help with neurotransmitter synthesis, the growth of new neurotransmitters. And vitamin D, when you have too low a level, that can help or, uh, hurt your cognitive function. Yes. Uh, Noma said, Nomakin says, B vitamins are abundant in meat and nuts, but they're water soluble, so you have to replace it every day. You can and should get a good amount of B vitamins every day, yes. Eggs says, I say B complex, but you find it very simple, really. Ha ha, you got me again. When it comes to minerals, magnesium and zinc are helpful for neurotransmission and protection of your neurons. Zinc and magnesium are often sold together in a ZMA uh, complex, again, complex. You can get them together at once if you're looking to supplement. Yes, touch grass or your thinky, no think, good, too good. It's Shepard. And as Noma has been talking about recently, omega-3 fatty acids, they are very good for your brain structure and function. So these are some of the nutrients that might help if you're looking to get a little bit of a boost in your memory and cognition. You shouldn't re rely on these in terms of supplementation. It's always preferable to get them from nutritional sources if you can. The two things you do want to avoid, of course, though, are stress and anxiety. High levels of stress and anxiety interfere with the encoding of those memories. That's the little blocked Wi-Fi symbol here. And cortisol, the so-called stress hormone, can affect your ability to form memories. Of course, we can't control all the stress in our lives. We can't control all the things that happen around us. It's going to happen. But you can try to minimize it. Take the time to do a breathing exercise before you study. And afterwards, do a little bit of mindful relaxation before and after. Give your brain a little bit of a break from that stress and anxiety. So that just before and just after you've studied or tried to learn something at work or remembered, your brain has the time to actually start putting those memories into long-term storage. We can't eliminate all of the stress in today's life, but we can reduce it a little bit. I will also say you should definitely minimize alcohol consumption. Alcohol is pretty strong and good at undermining memory formation. And there's one... Oh. 
there's one last little slide to go over. And that is ways we can stay sharp. Moving away from things that we want to avoid, we can go back to things that we do want to do. I'm just going to talk about a few general cognitive-based activities that can help us to stay sharp. You see the little crossword here, I'm sure. They're actually good. It does work. The research is there. Crossword puzzles do help with our word recall and association. It can stimulate our verbal memory and language skills. You see a little Sudoku up there as well. That can help with our logical reasoning, pattern recognition. That can help with our working memory, concentration. Chess pieces are up there. Chess is, of course, a strategic game. So it needs planning and foresight and memory. Hard games involve memory, attention, and strategic thinking. Jigsaw puzzles are also great because they require visual spatial reasoning, require a lot of attention to detail. Certain video games can even be beneficial. Do any of you know of or can think of any video games that you think might be good for memory or improving your cognition? While you're thinking about that, I'll touch on board games. Games like Scrabble, for example, are good for vocabulary recall and strategy. There are some specific brain training apps that have some, some study behind them that suggest they might be beneficial. A lot of people work with trivia games and think that will help. And mm, it can be somewhat helpful, but you know, just filling your head with random trivia might not be the best. Well, class, that is everything that I have for you on our lesson on memory. We just went through a little bit about how memory functions, the stages we go through. some of the techniques that are commonly used, why they don't work so well, other techniques that might be better, some tips that you might find yourself using in the future, and some other ways to stay sharp and to augment our brain function and development. Yes, yes, and thank you for that clip, Good Shepherd, as always. Then we have any questions, any thoughts before we proceed, anything you'd like to talk about?